course, there's the old uh, saying, I forget who said it, but I think it's, it was true in my life, which is if at the age of 21 you, you're you not a socialist, then you don't have any, any heart. And if by the age 30 you still are, then you don't have any brains. So <clears throat> that was kind of my experience. Uh, I started out young and idealistic and uh, social justice and fair distribution of resources and uh, we were, I didn't understand why everybody couldn't be equally prosperous. And starting my own business uh, was kind of a wake-up call in a number of different ways. Uh, I had to, I had to meet a payroll every week and we had to satisfy customers and we had competitors that, that we had to uh, uh, compete with in order to have those customers come into our stores. And we had to compete with other employers for our, uh, for our employees. We had to, the, the wages were under competitive pressures. So there was all this competition on us that, uh, that of course, made the, operating the business successfully difficult. And it's kind of like having to meet a payroll and having to meet the demands of our customers is a great uh, destroyer of utopian fantasies and utopia, utopian ideologies. You, you're in the real world and you have to, you have to meet the market test every day and, and every week. And I, I just found that the belief system that I had going into operating that business was, was inadequate to explain the experiences that I was having in business. And I began to uh, look around and read other books and other philosophies to try to make sense out of out of my life and out of my business experience. And it was really through encountering the the free market capitalist uh, philosophies of of, uh, of Milton Friedman and and uh, Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises and uh, uh, and, and many other. Uh, free market philosophers that I came to realize that this explanation made a lot more sense in my business experience and made more sense in terms of how the world really operated. And so that's when my worldview began to shift and I began to let go of being a, <coughs> a sort of a democratic socialist. Any type of political ideology is going to have a lot of different um, uh, variants of it. A lot of different uh, libertarians are, are constantly arguing with each other and who's the most pure libertarian and who's most ideologically pure. Uh, I have no real interest in those type of discussions or arguments. And uh, what I resist in one of the strains of libertarianism that I reject. I reject the idea that that humankind is essentially selfish, that uh, not only as an observation that we frequently are selfish, but there's a strain of belief, uh, particularly in the, in the Ayn Rand uh, uh, part of the movement, that believes people ought to be selfish, that, that that's a virtue, that humans are always self-interested and, and Altruism is evil, and, and love is uh, is something that uh, makes us weak. And so I reject that aspect of, of libertarianism. I'm 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 a caring, compassionate person, and I believe that free markets and free minds leads to the greatest human flourishing. So I really want humans to flourish, and I believe liberty and market economies and, and, and capitalism are the best strategies for full human flourishing. So I don't identify with that strain of libertarianism that uh, is sort of uncaring and uh, 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 kind of a social Darwinian uh, variant of it. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with that. I, I, I'm not that way myself. I do believe that many libertarians are animated by uh, human flourishing. They, 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 we sincerely believe that human flourishing, is, that we need to be free and that we need to be creative and that through human freedom, entrepreneurship, uh, that humans are creative, they create new ways of, uh, 
of creating value for each other that expresses itself through the economic system and leads to greater prosperity, not for a few, but for, for most people and, and eventually all people. So there is a, a strain of, of, of deep idealism in the libertarian movement. It's, again, sometimes masked over by that, uh, that ideology of selfishness, but um, the human flourishing element is definitely a big aspect of, uh, I think, of the motivational structure of many, many libertarians. Certainly it is for me. I think the zero-sum worldview is the predominant one. Uh, I think it's, it's something we've, we've evolved with, with, this idea that there's a, a limited fixed pie and we have to uh, distribute that pie in an equal, fair way, that no one should get uh, unfair large pieces of that pie. And if someone is getting a bigger piece, necessarily someone else may be getting a smaller piece since there's a finite amount of pie to go around. I also think it comes from our, our competitive sports in that in competitive sports there's, there's a winner and there's a loser. And so we play games, we play sports all our lives, so we come to believe that, that in the zero-sum worldview that some are winners and some are losers and, in a, and then we in a just society, then there should be no losers. There should be, uh, and so we need to, to, to limit the, the pieces of the pie anyone gets, so that everyone can have a fair and, and just piece of the pie. And I, so I reject that. I don't think there is a uh, necessarily a fixed pie. The beauty of capitalism, the beauty of conscious capitalism, is the realization that the pie can grow. That, that through voluntary exchange and through the value creation that happens when the stakeholders uh, voluntarily cooperate and voluntary exchange with, with each other is that, that the pie grows larger. And so there is more to distribute and that distribution takes place through the market, uh, through, the mar through market processes, through the exchange processes. As each, as each of the traders, of course, wants to get a uh, a bigger piece for themselves, and competition sort of ultimately determines the the percentages that each of the different constituencies or stakeholders gets in the exchanges. But that's a growing pie, and it's a win, 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 win game, and that turns me on. I'm very fired up and excited about that because it means human flourishing isn't trapped in some type of uh, uh, limited. Uh, uh, set of constraints. It means we can innovate and create our ways out of any of these traps, any of these uh, sort of, uh, I, I can't remember or think of the phrase right now, I'm trying to, I'm trying to recall, of, but this idea that we're in some type of, of trap of limited resources. And the only limitations we have are the limitations of human creativity, human imagination, and uh, intellectual capital that's been accumulated. As we continue to gain an intellectual uh, capital and as human creativity is unleashed and human entrepreneurship is unleashed, then the new, uh, the new innovations, the new creativity that expresses itself through the marketplace, through capitalism, allows us to solve problems that previously were thought to be insoluble. Uh, and, hum and humans uh, continue on the upward spiral. I mean, a great example of this is, is uh, people are very focused oftentimes on the fact that there's still a billion people on this planet that say live on less than a dollar a day and, that's a, and that certainly is a terrible tragedy. But if you put that in a historical context, that's about 15% of the people, uh, 15, 16, 17, less than 20% of the people alive on the planet live on less than a dollar a day. Whereas 200 years ago, 85% of the people alive on the planet Earth lived on less than a dollar a day, and that's in today's dollars adjusted for inflation. So poverty has always been the default condition of the human race. What's unprecedented is not poverty. What's unprecedented is wealth. Wealth for not a few, but prosperity for literally billions of people. Every, every year now, we see hundreds of millions of people escape from poverty just in two countries, China and India. It is the greatest 
revolution in human prosperity in all of human history. It's all occurred in the last 20 years. And it's, it's, a, it's a fact that you almost never see reported in the media. And instead, we tend to focus still on the, on the remaining people that are, po uh, that, are, uh, that are poor, and we're back on our zero-sum game that somehow or another, that's because other people are greedy and selfish, and they're keeping these poor people down. Rather than seeing poverty lessen through capitalism and through free market uh, expansion, uh, we tend to condemn the very thing that's allowing people to escape from poverty as the cause of the poverty. And it's ridiculous. It's uh, that capitalism and, and, and free markets are what's going to allow us to escape from poverty. Muhammad Yunus likes to say that, that by the end of the 21st century, poverty will be something that we only see in museums that uh, it'll be something people look back on and say, gosh, we used to have poor people? How, did, uh, how is that even possible? And I do think that's the future of humanity if we don't totally mess it up, that we are going to continue to learn, we're gonna have our intellectual capital spread, we're gonna unleash the human creativity, because uh, I do believe humans have limitless creativity, and we're gonna solve a lot of these problems that are holding us back now, and humanity is gonna continue to, its upward spiral and we are going to eliminate poverty. I, I think there are people alive today. Uh, I perhaps will not live to see the end of it, but there are pe young people alive today that will probably see the virtual end of poverty in the human race in the 21st century. From a macro perspective, conscious capitalism is becoming conscious of the framework that capitalism has to exist in, in, order to, in order to be successful, in order to flourish. There are certain key principles that, that have to be in place, and we have to nurture those principles or we won't have a capitalistic order. It's not something that automatically exists. It has to be, it has to have principles, it has to be grounded in those principles. And some of those principles include um, uh, uh, property rights, that we have to have the right for people to be able to own property. At the same time, there needs to be the freedom to exchange property. We need to be able to trade it. We need to be able to create something and then trade it or sell it to someone else. We need, uh, we need a rule of law. There needs to be laws that uh, are just and laws that are predictable and laws that apply to everyone in the society, including the government. The rule of law is essential. You cannot have a, a capitalistic order without the rule of law and it, whenever that comes into doubt or if they're not stable property rights you don't really have the the basis for the capitalistic order and finally you, you need a uh, uh, a freedom to trade uh, uh, usually the greater the uh, the fewer restrictions on the freedom to trade across the uh, uh, between people but also between uh, people in different states people in different countries the, the greater value creation that occurs. So anytime you see a society that's beginning to uh, restrict the ability to trade, you see a society that is going to lessen its prosperity. It, uh, it, p it tends to happen when people get preoccupied with the loss of jobs, not understanding that you may lose some jobs to uh, a foreign country if you allow freedom to trade, but you're gaining jobs at the same time. You're gaining more net jobs because the people won't give you their goods for free. They want to trade with you as well. And so those jobs and the goods that they want to trade for, the goods and services they want, that will create greater employment uh, at home. But that's very hard for the average person to understand. And so, um, but anyway, conscious capitalism is understanding these, these basic core economic values and becoming more conscious of them. Now conscious uh, business is, is the, the, there are certain principles behind that and one principle is that business has the potential for higher purpose. That uh, maximizing profits, if you ask people what the purpose of business is, they usually say, if you go to a cocktail party and ask that question, they'll generally say, well, everybody knows that, the purpose of of business is to maximize profits, it's to maximize shareholder value. And it's, but that's a very odd answer. 
Because that's not the answer we would give if you asked what the purpose of a doctor is, be to heal the sick, or what the purpose of a teacher is, to educate people, or what the purpose of a lawyer is, or what the purpose of an architect is, or what the purpose of an engineer is. So, so why is it that we would come to this odd answer that the purpose of business is to maximize profits? When I've known literally hundreds of entrepreneurs in my life, and with very few exceptions, very few of them actually created their businesses to try to maximize profits. Of course, they need to make money, but that's, I need to eat in order to live, I need to breathe in order to live, I need, my, I need to create red blood cells in order to live, but that's not the purpose of my life, to eat, to breathe, to create red blood cells. Uh, I have a much more transcendent purpose in my life that gives my life meaning and value to it. Business is no different. Um, a business has the potential for a higher and deeper purpose, and that's the first principle of a conscious business. Second principle is, is that there's a variety of, of stakeholders that are interdependent, that are connected together. Customers, employees, suppliers, investors, communities, both local and larger communities, and then the larger environment that we're part of. Those are the most important stakeholders. There are other stakeholders that are in like a form of wider circle, such as uh, uh, the government, uh, labor unions, uh, the media, activists of, of various kinds. But the idea being that um, these stakeholders are interdependent on one another and that the conscious business attempts to create value simultaneously for all of these interdependent stakeholders, that it seeks the win-win-win business strategy. That, and a, maybe a, a way to explain that in a simple model version as a retail business, which Whole Foods is, is that um, management's job is to help our, is to hire good people, train them well, and help them to be happy and fulfilled in their workplace, in their work, in their jobs. And then the team member's job is to uh, satisfy our customers, help the customers to be happy in their exchanges with the business. So happy team members leads to happy customers, and happy customers do more business with the, uh, with the company, and that leads to happy investors. So you have a virtuous circle of happy t uh, team members, happy customers, happy investors. Uh, that reflects in a simplified version this idea of the interdependent nature of the stakeholders and why you can't just focus on creating value for the investors alone because you must create value for the team members who then create value for the customers who then create value for the investors. So um, the conscious business is recognizes this, is conscious of it, and works to optimize value for all of the key interdependent stakeholders. The third principle of the conscious business is what we call conscious leadership, or you might also think of it as servant leadership, that, that the leaders of the organization they're not there to line their pockets and try to maximize their own personal gain. Instead, their job is to fulfill the higher purpose of the business, recognize and fulfill the interdependent stakeholder model, and in a sense to serve the organization, to um, uh, sublimate their own ego and their own ambitions for the good of the organization. And again, it's not self-sacrificial, or I'm not talking about altruism. I'm talking about recognizing that in the long term they will also gain the most through the flourishing of the business and through the flourishing of all the stakeholders. They too will flourish, that their identity is linked and their own, um, their own gain is linked to the gain of all these other stakeholders. And then the fourth principle is, is that to realize these first three principles you have to create a culture, a conscious culture that has strategies structures and processes that create a culture that optimizes the stakeholder model, fills the purpose, and allows the conscious leadership to do their jobs. So the culture provides that background and the processes and structures that the conscious business needs in order to, uh, to achieve its highest potential. So when you add those four principles together, you have a conscious business. When you add the conscious business with the key principles of the of the conscious of, the, of conscious capitalism, you truly have the larger uh, 
ecosystem of the conscious capitalistic uh, uh, society, one with conscious businesses that are exchanging in a consciously uh, capitalistic way. You've just articulated what I call the trade-off myth. Um, the belief that all this sounds very good, very idealistic, but it won't compete well in the marketplace. And when it runs up against a, a business that's not handicapped with this uh, idealism, then it'll be in trouble. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's the exact opposite, that in fact, the conscious business has competitive advantage. When you work from a higher purpose, you, you unleash greater degrees of commitment, greater degrees of loyalty, and greater creativity in the workplace. And that gives competitive advantage. When you work from the stakeholder model, um, you understand that you're trying to optimize the entire system. You're able to do that in such a way as when you optimize the entire system, you also optimize the the, the value that, you also, that you're creating for the investors as well. The business tends to flourish at a higher level. So in fact, the conscious business will win in most instances, all other things being equal, it will win in competition against less conscious businesses. And that's why I'm confident that over the long term, uh, conscious capitalism is going to triumph. It will, I believe it will become the new paradigm uh, in the 21st century not because it's, it's more idealistic or it sounds better, it'll become the dominant paradigm simply because it will win. It will win in the marketplace. And nothing succeeds in capitalism more than success itself. So good ideas that work spread. And the competitive nature of the marketplace is going to lead to these competitions between conscious businesses and less conscious businesses and uh, uh, the conscious businesses, all other things being equal, are going to win most of those battles. And so fairly quickly, meaning when I say quickly I mean 25, 30, 35 years, we're going to see more and more and more conscious businesses and we will make this shift towards conscious capitalistic society. My first instinct is to tell you that I do think retail is one of the first areas to shift, um, possibly because they're dealing with their customers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and they've got, they're more labor-intensive as well. They tend to hire and employ more people, like Whole Foods Market employs 57,000 people. So we're, um, and we have millions of customers. So in a sense, uh, and we're in a, an extremely competitive marketplace, food retailing, and we don't have any patents, we don't have any, and the government's not protecting uh, us in some way from competition, so, and we have formidably, competitors are much larger than, than us, so like Walmart, Kroger, Safeway, companies like that, so uh, retail uh, is one of the first areas to shift, and many of the conscious businesses that I know uh, tend to be either retailers or service businesses, companies like the Container Store or Costco or Starbucks uh, or the Southwest Airlines. Um, uh, the, these are, uh, uh, are businesses that, uh, Trader Joe's, these are businesses that uh, are retailers or service oriented. So I do think maybe the conscious, uh, rev conscious business revolution, conscious capitalism re re revolution will see that take hold in a more large-scale way in the retail and service first. I can predict also possibly what will be last. I predict possibly Wall Street will be last uh, or the uh, pure financial part of our economy, which uh, to a greater extent, its stake it doesn't have as much of a stakeholder model. It does tend to be dominated by the, the uh, profit uh, uh, profit maximization model and shareholder return model to a greater degree than other segments of our society. So I suspect retail and services will be first and the financial sector will be last. I do think that um, the economy is going to continue to evolve towards uh, more service, uh, 
that human beings are doing more things to serve one another in terms of services. Uh, but the new things are, if you think about the whole technology area, so much of that didn't even exist uh, 10, 15 years ago. There, there was no Facebook, there was no Google, uh, there was no iPods, there were no iPhones. Uh, really, Blackberries didn't even exist 15 years ago. So, so many different things changed so rapidly. Uh, and new th industries and whole industries can be created fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, I think it's safe to say that we're going to see greater innovations in education that here's an area that needs radical innovation, that we don't allow competition, we don't allow, we haven't unleashed human creativity. So education, potentially, if we could unmonopolize education and truly allow entrepreneurs to get going on that, uh, I can't think of hardly, healthcare and education are the two most regulated areas in our society, and they're also the ones that are most are least satisfactory to people. Those are areas that we need to to demonopolize and allow more competition to occur. So those are two huge areas. Education uh, uh, and healthcare are both service areas. So th those are growth industries. I also think all types of leisure, uh, travel is a is a as the society becomes uh, more affluent, its its desire to travel uh, increases and to explore that. The younger generation today, people that are in their 20s, for example, they have traveled so much more than my generation had. I mean, for me, a big deal when I was in my 20s, I'd go down to Mexico, and uh, that was like the foreign country, or maybe get up to Canada. But today, people haven't just gone to Europe, uh, but they've gone all over the world. By the time they're 30 years old, if they're young and well-educated, they, they've, they've, world travel is going to be continued to be. Uh, 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 it's, in particular, as globalization continues to occur, we're going to continue to explore. I also think um, uh, huge, huge possibilities in entertainment. I mean, look how much entertainment has evolved and shifted. Uh, in a sense, something like Big Think, it's education, it's entertainment, uh, it's, uh, and it's a synthesis of those two, and it's probably got lots of other things in it as well that I haven't just picked up yet. Um, I, I do see lots more creativity, lots more innovations, lots more entrepreneurship around, uh, around entertainment and uh, humans uh, uh, educating one another, entertaining one another, serving one another, uh, new ways for humans to enjoy life, new ways for humans to learn and grow. Uh, uh, we are going to continually try to figure out ways to serve ourselves better. And uh, uh, it's, it's amazing how even, think about something like Pilates. It didn't exist on any kind of scale 25 years ago. Yoga existed, but hardly anybody did it. Now you see those are, are activities that are also leading to greater human flourishing through helping humans to be uh, more fit and, and stronger, uh, more flexible. So. It's fascinating watching the world and watching humans uh, uh, evolve and watching our society evolve. It's, uh, uh, I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to be part of it and to have contributed a little bit to it myself.